Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this British School of Fashion seminar discussion um, around how sustainability and inclusion um, is, is helping to reshape um, the employment opportunities um, within the fashion and luxury sectors. So joining me um, today, I have an esteemed panel, um, which includes um, Diana Nieto, who is the CEO of Positive Luxury, welcome. Um, we have uh, Eunice Desai, who is co-founder and director of First Directory, um, luxury and fashion recruitment agency. Um, and we also have Sophie Svestad, who is um, fulfilling two roles here, actually. One is a current MBA luxury brand management student, and also um, she is working um, within the industry, and we'll talk about that, that a bit later. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have Professor Natasha Radcliffe-Thomas, who is a co uh, colleague of mine at British School of Fashion. Um, and Natasha, you, you're pointing out that it is um, Circular Economy Week. Yes, thank you, Tim. So welcome, panel. Um, yes, yeah, so GCU London, which is where British School of Fashion is located, right in the heart of London and Spitalfields, we are one of the first uh, higher education institutions in London to sign up to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Direction of Travel Towards a Circular Economy. And as part of our commitment, we're really delighted to be taking part in this Circular Economy Week London event. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Natasha. So we, for the benefit of the audience, um, we've got deliberately industry perspectives and an academic perspective and a student perspective. So we're looking at our own circular um, view, if you like, of um, education in this particular fashion and luxury industry sector. Um, and we've got four themes around which the discussion is going to sit. Uh, one is obviously the um, impact of the pandemic. Secondly is the impact of that on changing business models. Uh, the importance of people within all of this um, and then finally what, what it all shakes down to as far as employability and jobs are concerned so that we will uh, attempt to get through all this um, in a nice coherent way and also um, draw out I think which important um, knowledge and understanding that we have around this so so the first thing I would say is that that the the impact on the pandemic across the world revealed the fragility of the world or our world I think um, and uh, you know, because of people not being able to travel and you know, the terrible illness and deaths and so on. So, um, Diana, if I can start with you first, please, could you just give me give us your assessment of the um, the main changes to business arising from the pandemic? Thank you, Tim. And it's a real honor uh, to be here with you today. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. I think the pandemic um, has been a catalyst, um, a catalyst for change and has actually turned all our worlds upside down, business and non-business. Um, from a business perspective, what we have seen is an acceleration in all the trends that they were there in the very beginning of uh, 2019, accelerating exponentially towards 2021. Some of these is the digital drive, obviously, in terms of that we have spent more time than ever before online, either shopping, chatting, doing Netflixing, or anything else that you choose to, to do. Um, and businesses have adapted uh, very quickly to that. Um, especially luxury brands had to do quite a lot of adaptation um, because if you look at the big spectrum, um, and the advanced curve that they were pre-pandemic, they had quite a lot to catch up very, very soon because the experience from a digital perspective, from a luxury perspective, was not mainly digital or in a digital form. Um, the other areas that also we have seen is um, the way that uh, businesses have actually adapted to a, a hybrid uh, way of working. So, um, you know, obviously we had to stay home and this has been globally. Um, and now that people are coming back to work, um, there is no almost like a discussion to actually have a, 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 a hybrid business model. So a couple of days at home, a couple of days at work and actually work onto that. So setting up the systems for this to become um, something that is regular. And I think the ones that have benefited the most about the pandemic, and I think there is a silver lining, is actually women, especially young women, Gen Zs and, uh, you know, alphas. 
you know, when we were in business, we always have to be presentism and, you know, uh, always have been a choice between career and kids. I think what the pandemic has given, and not people actually talk openly about this, but it's actually the opportunity to women to juggle something that women do uh, has mastered that skill from very early age. And this is going to allow this kind of, uh, not just basically be able to come back to work, you know, take my maternity leave and actually come back to work without having to miss much because of, of this idea of juggling. So working from home is actually very, very beneficial. And I guess the last bit is about, um, you know, how we shop and what we shop. So we are much more mindful about what we buy, how we buy, which brands we buy from. Um, and this is Circularity Week, very much uh, uh, pointed out by uh, Professor Natasha earlier. And, you know, we need to celebrate these businesses that are investing in the circular economy, the businesses that are investing in sustainability overall. But most importantly, it's not just about setting targets, for 2050, it's about meeting targets in 2025 and 2030. So in in a quite quick summary, in the next 10 years, what I'm the most excited about is, is gonna be the decade of change and the decade of action. So no more empty promises with very long time leads, which will never achieve, but actually accountability at very senior level and all the way throughout the organization um, to actually take action to be able to be really companies really be the guardians of, of our world. Thank you very much, Diana. So great start there for us. Um, so I'm taking away from that. There's been a significant shift in values and that um, community and technology have been really been brought to the fore. Um, Eunice and Natasha, but you, Eunice first, perhaps um, any thoughts on that? Anything you'd like to add around that? Hi everyone, thanks for having me on board as well with you all. I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Um, just pick up what Diana said. I mean, a lot of the points I was nodding continuously through that because I'm very agreeable with um, from my side coming from the recruitment um, from the luxury for the luxury sector. I've seen a lot of the um, obviously been very at the heart of the job transformation for people with a number of redundancies, the uh, closure of businesses, which has been very heartfelt. Um, as a recruiter, we're sat in the middle trying to connect people with jobs and. It's never in 20 years history, never had so many great candidates on the market with so few jobs to offer. Um, and the change in all of this, obviously, from bricks and mortar retail, as we've seen the close up, is the pickup in the digital side on the platforms. The number of startups has never been so many. Um, I had a call yesterday with a potential client who is adding 100 on 100 headcount per year. And they've only been a startup for the last two, three years, and they raised 26 million like that for a digital business. Um, the great thing is they're solving a problem of landfill, so it's resale, resale of old stock clothing. So again, it shows the mindset as what Diana said about values, people putting money where their mouth is, having to do things that are environmentally friendly. But I think in the world of luxury and retail and digital, it's moved super fast where we were always heading to, as we all know, in a very short time. Um, with this, I've found people have had to deal with transformation of skill sets. Suddenly we've been used to comfort zones and we've always operated in a certain way. I'm like yourselves, possibly a sad at home. I am now a new father, so I am I am that mother now working from home father situation, which I've experienced over the last year. So I I totally relate to what you're saying. I have a lot more empathy <laughs> um, for all my female colleagues and counterparts who are out there who work careers and have families, and I I think I've lived that that balance. So uh, for me, I think there's been a lot more of a humanity people a lot more open conversation about life and where we've sat over the last year what we've experienced and i think from a business perspective people are a lot more i would like to think connected in their values um on a personal level then from a company level as diana said people have to put their money where their mouth is people have talked about diversity environment massive slogans advertising in some are very reactionary to black Lives matter situation that happened and they were very quick to marketing to show that they stood behind it but what's actually transpired from that a year on? Have they actually lived up to their expected their, what they've said? So um, I think there's a lot, a lot to happen, um, a lot going to happen, and I think what Diana said as well. Time, time, line, time, timelines will need to be a lot shorter. Um, people are not going to have the patience to wait to see things dragged out. They want results quite quickly, and I think we're in a world where we expect things a lot faster these days um, in in the way that we live. So 
I think there's a lot to happen, a lot going to come, and hopefully there will be positivity and a lot of lessons learned. If we thank you, good takeaways from this. Thank, thanks very much, Edith. And Natasha, um, can I draw, bring you in to, to, you know, reflect on some of these points, perhaps across the wider fashion industry, other, other than not just luxury? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big things, um, as both Diana and Eunice picked up on, is fashion and luxury. I mean, they're part of our lives. You know, we work in them. People are related to them especially things like clothing, fashion is really related to our everyday activities. And one of the things that the, you know, the lockdowns had was a massive impact on all of our habits and behaviours, which then kind of translated in a real period of reflection. So I think both as sort of consumers of fashion and luxury and as people involved in businesses, um, people have had to really think about what the what their personal part is, where their values sit, and then how they're part of big systems. And I think it's really, in one sense, brought the world closer together because people have started to realise the interconnectedness of issues that go, you know, associated with things like supply chains. I mean, pre-pandemic, how many people were talking about supply chains? Now everyone's a sort of supply chain expert. Um, and I think what's been uh, obviously from an awful situation, some positive takeaways are that people are, are actually wanting, they're craving that information and the conversation has really shifted. So I think pre-pandemic, a lot of um, you know brands were making noises. You're talking about brands with purpose and purpose for luxury. During the lockdowns, we saw some of the big you know, luxury and fashion players actually act on those in terms of how they supported, um, you know, mask making, distributing PPE, that kind of thing, so actual positive actions. Uh, and also the conversations that we were having in the media around the purpose of fashion and the role and its responsibilities. And I think as both Diana and Eunice have said, what we need to see now is that coming through and that sort of being actually acted on and taken further. We sort of don't want to go back. Um, and I think we've recognised a lot of the challenges. We've recognised how complex they are, but that there are some positive solutions there, which hopefully we're going to be discussing in the, the next sections as well. Thank you, um, Natasha. Uh, Sophie, if I could bring you in as as uh, the millennial amongst us here, you know, we often read all the research around the fact that millennials and possibly Gen Z, the older ones, um, actually act rather than just talk. Um, you know, how accurate is that? I mean, it, it, you know, is your generation going to simply bypass businesses that don't meet your expectations in that sense? Well, I think there'll always be an interest um, for businesses who not, don't necessarily um, follow all of the value sets because there's always going to be people who go towards those businesses as well. But the shift that I'm personally seeing amongst friends and peers is that what exactly what Natasha said is the follow through is more important than the pure marketing aspect of being um, a value based company. Um, and I think that's the major shift as before it was such a representation of a brand of how they marketed themselves, which obviously still is. But now people are looking at um, who do you support politically, especially in America, um, and what brands do in their supply chains, as Natasha said. So there's a much bigger focus on the actual follow through. And yes, that's very apparent in um, in the Gen Z generation. Um, so yeah, but I think it's really interesting. I only think that that will expand because I'm only hearing more and more about it from friends and it's only becoming more and more of a conversation no matter where we are, what we're doing. Um, as before, it wasn't even something really talked about. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the second um, big area run to this theme of impact of pandemic, I suppose, is, is about who's driving this. Um, and I, I'm sort of minded to reflect on Nike's, one of their 11 maxims is let the consumer decide. So I'm going to pose a question to, to Deanna. Um, is this consumer driven? Um, you know, how, to what extent is there evidence that consumers want to know how products are made? They want to know or be aware of the, the, the uh, reduction in the social and environmental cost. And they also want to know what's happened to products after, after use. There's more of a, an understanding of things. What, what do you think? I think it's not just exclusively from a consumer perspective. I think it's the first time in history in which basically um, there is this perfect constellation, this really beautiful alignment of the investment in the investment community, uh, the investment community valuing companies that actually are, inve are investing in sustainability in turn. So they will actually prefer to invest in companies that have ESG um you know metrics so environmental social governance metrics and those companies are becoming much more valuable they also understand the concept of stranded assets um so a car that have petrol is a stranded asset today 
because you will have no room for, uh, you know, um, the world that we all want to live in. So, you know, um, I think that that's a big, big driver, especially big driver for business that are actually in, innovating. And with that comes, you know, the, the innovation on carbon capture, the innovation in different business models, uh, the innovation, uh, and I will drill into that in a second, but um, innovation overall, and even innovation in the way that we um, we look at employing people, um, not, sure, not only from a, a, a mix, like, you know, the diversity and inclusion part, but also the geographies and the value of global teams in, in, in specifically location areas. Um, the other aspect is the speed in which companies are actually internalizing these changes. So they're actually listening actively because they know that actually is change or is irrelevance. Um, so Nike has been deeply challenged for companies like Allbirds, for example, um, and other companies that are uh, kind of came out from nowhere and they have valuation that are staggering and actually the love of consumers. Um, and that requires material innovation, requires business model innovation and so on. Even big department stores are challenged today because we want uh, a shift on ownership and to renting or leasing, um, uh, reselling. I mean, we, we know that our wardrobe is, uh, is an asset and we actually can either resell it or we can rent it. Why not? You know, and make pocket money. Um, so, you know, the value of items are beyond the intrinsic value itself, but actually what is the, the resale or the renting value? So when you have to make a choice as a consumer, do you buy a five pound t-shirt that will actually be destroyed into five washes or do you invest a little bit more and you can then make money out of that t-shirt? So I think the, the, the choices that consumers are being faced are not just from a values perspective, but from an economic perspective. And lastly, the last bit of the constellation is, or, or this alignment is government. I've been working in sustainability for a hell of a long time. Uh, so almost 23, 24 years. And I never seen in my entire career government to actually put out soft legislation, consultation, and turn into legislation at this speed that is happening now. And this is not just UK-wise. This is Europe, it's US, it's China. The whole world is finally aligning and coming to the realization that we cannot eat money and we cannot eat clothing. So, uh, you know, we need to actually be much more respectful so biodiversity is becoming to the fore, and this is not just about um, oceans, it's also about land and our relationship with nature. Because actually, let's face it, everything that we eat or we wear, except from jewelry, comes from our soil. Um, so we need to have that respect. Um, so I think, yes, consumers are massively important, but consumers doesn't have the depth of knowledge. They have the depth of taste and making decisions uh, for what they read. But this accountability is now being taken by governments, by certifications, uh, by, um, by the investment community. And of course, consumers are ultimately the ones who benefit from all of these other bits that are there. So I think, I think we're in a, good, in, a good, uh, in a good space and I'm excited about the future. I wish I was 20 years younger to see through, um, only for that really. But I think Sophie's generation will have to finish the work that, you know, people like John Elkington and Jonathan Porritt have started. We try to continue and you guys will have to finish it off. So I really hope that you take the button and just run forward. Absolutely. That's what we're all, all about here. And uh, Sophie is for evidence of that. So thank you. Um, Eunice, do you want to pick up on any of those issues? Um, or, you know, how, how these kind of operational changes um, are reflected in, in sort of fashion, luxury fashion job market? Um, yeah, for, for me, again, it's a lot of agreeable points there. I mean, the sustainability side has been a conversation coming through for the last couple of years, especially. And then having worked with brands like Stella McCartney for a very, very long time ago, was always flying the flag for me as a client, one of my clients on the environmental side and um, non-animal products. And then obviously from there, it's just momentum has grown. Um, and I've spoke to so many candidates, some are from GCU, have gone on to work in other areas of sustainability. And I think it's become, a once, as we've said, our personal lives and our personal values align with what we do, who we align ourselves with, who we represent, uh, who we vote for, all these things connect as a circular, then who we want to work for. 
and then what companies are, from my perspective also now at who they're hiring they're not just hiring a candidate based on cv experience it's more about who are you in a culture fit are you our type of person do you share our values um so a lot of that is is playing into whether people will go for a certain role or job not but the good thing is it's for me it's opened up the job market and so many more career opportunities in the area of sustainability from content creating man content management um, marketing digital it's, it's created a whole nother category of roles for people who are very enthused about this i have a couple of candidates who picked on what diana said about reselling wardrobe they're constantly on instagram creating recreating their wardrobe and they're creating a business out of it so i think entrepreneurship in the age that we're living for gen z and this young generation are so savvy and again i wish i was 20 years younger with all these digital tools to my hand because i think god i would take it by the horns and do so much more than i probably did in my 20s because we didn't have these tools so i think the young generation now are opinionated they have a voice they have a, they are their, their own little businesses everyone is a little entrepreneur with the whole world at their fingertips and that is great because it brings a lot more change to the world and i think it's going to be positive change if there's a lot more gretas in the world and if that's what i'm leaving for my daughter to pick up and have greta as her role model then i think those are the kind of people that i would love to that we the world to emulate and support um and careers wise if these are the values that the young generation are being taught through education through corporations through internships and businesses um then i think we could be in a much better place thank you i i I want to move into other areas shortly, but I can't resist the temptation to bring Sophie in here, um, who, who is part of the younger generation that Eunice just referred to. Sophie, you're on the program, the MBA Luxury Brand Management. Um, just frankly, you know, how, how, how is the world that's being outlined here reflected across your studies? And, um, and also, to some extent, you know, what, are your, what was your experience about getting your job as a social media coordinator? Well, I can say that um, even in the first time I spoke to you, Tim, about getting on the course, um, there was such a focus on making a positive change. And that was essentially what I found to be really, really um, appealing. Um, as obviously you think MBA luxury ma brand management, um, obviously now I know there's so much more than uh, there's so much sustainability and it focused on ESG. Um, but I was surprised and also super happy to hear that um, from the get go um, about the focus on on the on creating a positive impact in the future. And that really held through. Um, we learned so much um, about the circular economy and everything we're talking about now and how to make that positive impact um, and how to, as Natasha has also gone through with us, um, finding out your personal values and how you can reflect that in your career. Um, th there's been such a, um, a great focus on it. And I think that anyone who came into the course, um, not really uh, knowledgeable or aware of what was of what's continuing to happen now, um, really does have a good grasp about it, a grasp of it. Um, and that, well, my interview for my job, which is a social media and content coordinator for um, uh, a French company, which I love. Um, the first interview I came back to Tim and I remember saying I've never used this much of my academic learning in the real world as I have now um, which was super refreshing um, and not because I don't work hard but because it's so applicable um, and yeah I can tell even now um, when I'm in my job how much of it is really coming to fruition um, so yeah, I really obviously have appreciated everything I've learned in this course and the hands-on kind of collaborative study it is. So yeah. Great. Thank you very much for that. So segueing into the sort of the second theme and where of time here. Um, clearly, you know, we're dealing with the issue of different business models because we we understand, I think, that um, part of the problem for fashion and luxury is this permanent consumption and the idea of degrowth in certain product categories that we're consuming particularly those that are using new virgin materials um for, and so i suppose what i'm going to ask um maybe natasha first and then diana uh, and you eunice to come in and after is to what extent um is there a shift at looking at sales mix so we obviously we've got um the patagonia model and perhaps um Natasha, you could outline what that represents in terms of revenue streams. And then I think, Diana, 
afterwards is this model that's going to be replicated across the sector um, other than from a, a few you know sort of genuine innovative enthusiastic brands so natasha Great, thank you. Well, Patagonia is a really interesting company that, you know, they're based in outdoor wear. And I think it's a company and a brand where you see the values, the relationship with the land, the sort of whole person um, reflected in, in business decisions. So based in the States um, and a lot about, you know, quality, respect of materials, but then also thinking about longevity and keeping things, you know, the antithesis of fast fashion in a sense. And really the idea, I suppose, of, you know, that luxury has at its fingertips of building quality products out of quality materials to last. I think one of the things that they've been really great at is that kind of showing the way and showing that by investing in alternative responsible materials, by taking account of challenges where you have them and where, you know, we have a big call out culture where people point out mistakes that are made, addressing them. But one of the big things that I think is really, you know, of the moment is their sort of repair and, and resale. And it's so interesting. I mean, Deanna talked about the speed of this. You know, a couple of years ago, we were talking about this model um, as this really kind of, I don't know, isolated virtually example. And now almost every brand is taking this on board. And I think that's from, you know, two sides. One of them is the personal side of, you know, the people within the businesses, you know, um, I suppose wanting to do that from their own values, but also sort of canny business sense, because actually you're kind of capturing the value that you already have in your, in your products. And I think one of the things that the resale uh, market has done for luxury brands is for them to go, hang on a minute, if someone over there is selling our products, why don't we actually um, get back into that? But I think, you know, uh, fashion and luxury learn a lot from other fields. And I think the whole sharing economy piece, people thought there would be a huge consumer resistance to it, like they thought there'd be a huge consumer resistance to buying things online. And there actually hasn't been. People have really adopted this. And I think there's a whole bunch of people who like the idea of circularity because of its sustainability credentials. I think there's a whole bunch of people who like the idea of circularity and sharing economy because of te the tech innovation. And I think that's one of the, the ways that, that fashion often sort of leads um, the way in exploring these. So I think we're definitely seeing in terms of, you know, retail, sorry, there go my dogs um maybe i'll duck out i've got dogs so okay thank you that's a brilliant um introduction to that deanna um <clears throat> yeah, you were quoted the ft conference recently talking about maybe 40 percent of of um brands business uh, revenues will be coming from these um non-virgin new product um areas if you like revenue streams it, over the next three to five years have you got any view on how extensive that will be across the sector I think this is here to stay. And we did this report with Bain in which we actually have quantified, um, you know, this growth. Can we carry on growing at the rate that we are growing or can we actually diversify business models in which we can actually look at services in order to actually make up for the loss of revenue? Because we have reach in the developed world, peak stuff, you know, too much of everything. Um, and um, I don't have a new number because we've done the projections to 2030, but I think this will actually go into different categories. So fashion, definitely we have, you know, uh, fashion and accessories and actually watches. You have renting, reselling um, and repurposing is one for jewelry. So you take your old jewelry, take the stones, repurpose and actually pay the jeweler for uh, the new design that you might get. So, and of course, repairing is massive in terms of what you can do. And this also kind of comes sometimes hand in hand with customization. So you not only repair something, but you actually turn a slightly different. There are great business models like Eileen Fisher. You have your old cashmere. You might be a little bit bored. You put some weight on. You might lose some weight or whatever. You go, at, no, no team you look great so you go in and you get your cashmere taken in or taken out and actually get a refresh and i think there is um this is actually trickling down through all these kind of like the luxury segment or, or or the um you know luxury lifestyle across many many categories this is not exclusive to that because also in and furniture um on a circularity perspective and I am not a fan of IKEA, but hats off for them. They actually are taking back and recycling all the stuff that 
you know you might not want anymore so there is no like just put it in the in the bin it's actually you can take it back and they will take care of it so this is a massive plus for them and the second there is a lot of um you know kind of uh renting and leasing your furniture um and one of the probably uh, assets that are actually going up in value is secondhand furniture or pre-loved furniture. So if you want something original, beautiful, and actually something that you can resell, buy something that is 200 years old, you know, uh, it's it's good. And I think this is something that um, it's, uh, is this idea the new is good. It's, mm. it's going to, it's not going to disappear, but it's going to start being mixed with different concepts in terms of giving value to things that are not new. And, and, and I think it's going to be a mix. You know, life is a pendulum. We have swung very, very far away from one direction and we are probably swinging too far away on the other direction. But at some point, this is why I said earlier, you know, Sophie, the alphas, they have to finish the work because that's when they will kind of, we will take a pause and think, okay, how we can actually go forward in a more sustainable way. And I'm not talking about just natural resources, sustainability, I'm talking about over time. So uh, uh, business models that actually have this longevity because clearly two digit, two digit growth are not sustainable. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, there, there are so many questions I could bring in as a result of that. I mean, the thing I will do is plug Stephen Webster because obviously he, he repurposes jewelry an awful lot and that's absolutely fascinating you know turning um old i don't know maybe a divorced person's wedding ring into something else you know but it, it, it's it's generated a whole raft of um if like new business models but um sophie i saw your eyes light up there when um, deanna was talking about furniture did you want to add anything to that actually well yes um that is a huge thing i actually thought about there's um the new influences that are really getting really big now or are really big of the Gen Z. That's what I was thinking about, like Mia Reagan and Emma Chamberlain, if that says anything to you. Um, they're all about, I mean, Mia Reagan is huge on Depop. That's like her thing. She will have fashion shows um, with everything that she's got um, recycled, bought recycled. And Emma Chamberlain is super into pre-loved uh, furniture. So it's, um, it's just super true that no matter which category of luxury or consumerism at all it's um it's definitely going towards the re uh, the re pre-loved as i call it and i also thought of um there's this new app called the sojo app which is they say that it's a delivery for uh for clothing alterations and there's this 22 23 year old woman called um josephine phillips who started it straight out of university and it's doing um, and it's already doing well, even though it's still we're still in COVID. Um, and I just thought about that. And she started it, um, obviously, for convenience. But um, just all of these things making it so much easier to live a certain way. And that's where we're really going. And it's just that's very, very interesting you say yeah. that because it, it takes you back to, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago when I don't know, Natasha and um, Deanna remember this, but um, a certain luxury shoe brand launched um, shoe emergency repair service in new york um you know that would fit right in now i think obviously ahead of their time but but um eunice just to wrap up this idea around business models obviously tech is un underpinning a lot of this um it's not the only thing but it is underpinning it i mean how is technology reshaping roles within the industry in general across luxury and fashion do you think um i mean just to go on a lot of what both of everybody said there i i'm totally behind all of it um especially uh, i've seen so many like so if you mentioned about the alteration services i loved over the last 12 months reading about so many young entrepreneurial ideas and just to not without diversifying i think everything that everybody was listening was saying and i was nodding nodding is like i think what we've realized is that we have so much stuff around us we are consumed with whether it's 10 of this two of that and then you've been sat in your house for the last year 15 months and like do i need three of that and five i only need one because i don't even wear it to go out and i think it's that literally we've paused the button reflected what's around us taken stock and then we've now solved problems from all of that and i think that's the great thing hopefully as humans what we've done is problem solved a lot of our own issues that we were just running on this rat race of life working career hard fast consume consume the world is exploding we're deforestating everything and now we're suddenly oh gosh this is what we've done so i think the massive pause button has been 
unfortunately come out of a very hard pandemic has really done us as a long term some great good uh, as society. Uh, but coming back to your question about yeah. jobs, um, again, this has brought fast forward a lot of tech jobs. Um, a lot of uh, companies are now creating solutions at a tech and digital base. The thing is, um, to have the skill set to match that. So obviously, I got a call from a client the other day who's looking for uh, someone with uh, a computer science background. And these are conversations that I've never had in the last couple of years. So a lot more requirement for tech, for skilled based people in that area. There are the amount of jobs for DevOps, for engineers, back end. They, these are the new cool era of um, categories of um, jobs for people, for career paths. If, I'm, I'm say, I, in the last 12 months, I was saying to so many retail people, if you do not have any tech skills, do free Google courses, get mm. program um, friendly, learn a bit about Python, learn a bit about UX, understand the language even because when you're looking at jds these days a lot of it may be what you're used to but there'll be an element of crm systems compatibility to working in a digital world so we've had to train retrain re-educate um go forward in a different way and bring ourselves let's say with the world where sophie's generation already started from so they my age group and older are having to catch up but the younger generation are already there and i think they're going to lead the way in the digital world and the, the job market is there for it because the, the amount of jobs out there is great um, if the skill if the the population can meet the skills that that's required thank you I'm um, just on that I think list um, you know the, the the business list LOST mm -hmm. use a lot of data scientists and um, yeah so point well taken there um, I think I'll move on to our third third area now which is about people and Interestingly, from a couture point of view, um, the uh, creative director of Valentino, um, Pierre Paolo, said that um, the value in couture now is is much more in appreciating the work and the, the background story of the people who have handmade the garments rather than necessarily just the luxurious materials. Um, you know, Natasha and you know, is, is that something that you recognize as, as a sort of shift in values um, elsewhere? Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> as a maker myself, I think it's really important to value uh, making skills. And as much as we've been talking about digital, um, and although we have digital fashion, many of our clothes and products are actually still handmade. And I think people might be surprised how much, you know, hand work is still involved. You know, we often think that things are sort of mass manufactured and, and made by robots somewhere, but actually there's still quite a lot of hand work there. I definitely see the conversation shifting. And I think a lot of this has become um, that the notion of sustainability and even circularity has has awakened ideas around social justice. And people have realized, you know, as the other speakers have mentioned, that a lot of the consumption has happened in the global north. A lot of the extraction has happened from the global south, both in terms of sort of materials, environmental damage, but also in terms of income inequalities. I'd love to think that it that we were going that way. I don't think we're there yet. And I think it's, it's harder for those, um, you know, big organizations with, with shareholders to shift this way because you know where where is that coming from it's cutting into the bottom line I think probably what's more interesting and reflects back to business models is where someone is founding a luxury business as a social enterprise and that's something that's really exploded over the last few years um, and I think a lot of people when they're starting a business now are thinking what's a problem that I could solve through business, through creativity, through innovation, mm. and maybe fashion or luxury is the kind of vehicle for that. And so Tengri is a, a luxury menswear brand that I've been um, familiar with. And they really had this, that sort of approach of how to support Mongolian yak farmers through a luxury business. And I recommend people go away and, and, and look them up aside. So I think it's easier for a new business to be founded with those sort of values and to respect people and, and planet but I'm not sure I think it's difficult I think we see a lot of um, movement maybe in in some sort of the middle ranks so, but we don't see lots of let's say female CEOs we don't see a lot of diversity or we see a lot of diversity in front of the camera maybe in marketing campaigns we don't see a lot of diversity behind the scenes so there's still a long way to go but again the conversations are happening and maybe that's you know a great it's a great place to start 
but I'm always an optimist. So I think surfacing the issues, surfacing the challenges, asking the questions and showing, you know, best practice and, and ways to go. Um, and I think that does also then link back a bit to what Eunice was saying about the skills that people need. You've never needed to be a more kind of like renaissance person. You need the creative skills. You need sort of, you know, digital awareness. You need to have your own moral compass. I mean, and it's all coming together. I think for a lot of, especially younger people, but not just younger people, some people coming to their second, third, fourth careers are finding that a heady mix. And it's a really exciting place to be in, but certainly still challenges. Thank you, Deanna. I saw you nodding there. And um, it takes me back to a point you made earlier about uh, money being around for investing in, that, in the businesses which have that kind of appropriate outlook. Do you want to add anything more around that from building on what Natasha just said? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with Natasha. And I think Sophie made a brilliant point earlier, which and I think Eunice, Eunice as well, in terms of like, you know, nowadays you have these really great ideas, uh, startups that you know, they can get funding super quickly if they are technical, if they're digital, and if they have sustainability at the heart of it. So, I mean, it's, uh, I think the world is aligning. So no, nothing else. I think uh, everybody has made already brilliant points. Thank you. So um, we're in we're in the sort of section I call people because everywhere I, I look, there's a an angle on companies understanding that people are core to the success of the future. Uh, in one way or another. And uh, Eunice, obviously, one of the key platforms, this is is understanding the, um, I, I think, the productivity benefits alone of a more diverse workforce. You know, can you just talk us through um, your views on how the industry has reacted to um, D&I, diversity and inclusion, you know, really kicked off last year through um, BLM, but and perhaps you know frank your frank views on on the extent to which you know some of people were just jumping on bandwagons or that it's it's a, a you know a structurally good shift that you're seeing um i thought with this on this particular point i i, I thought it'd be relevant for me to go like I, i've been in this industry for 20 years in recruitment and in recruitment obviously you're always in the world of trying to select people for jobs based on skill set and non prejudgment obviously we don't live in an ideal world and the fashion business is probably the biggest victim of all of that where a face fits a brand, an image, and from a marketing perspective, from a culture fit, from are they to, are they an us type of person? And I've been unfortunately had to subject to recruiting, putting people forward to companies for interviews, and then just being told, oh, they're not us. And when you try to get to underneath what is not us, you kind of have to read between the lines what's not us. And when you go out in the stores and you see the campaigns and you see a general overview of what the us is, you know who's being excluded. So I am so happy now to be that we're in this new conversation space where companies are actually putting multicultural diversity, people of all gender, all background, all faiths, beliefs, um, ways of living together and realizing that that's, that's a secular way of living is much better because you bring a melting pot of everybody from everywhere with different ideas, different values, different backgrounds, which adds more value to the table. Because if you have the same line of people coming from the same schooling, the same families, it's just one tunnel vision way of working continually that just perpetuates. So I'm now glad to say that even when I'm recruiting from a retail level to a non-retail level, the idea of who they are and what they're about is more interesting as a, what the person's in, interests are, what their passions are, what languages they speak, where they're from, what their values are, as well as their skill set, because they are a whole, a whole person. We're all individuals that bring more than just our job. Uh, you know, I would say Tim and I become good friends. We have come from different parts of the world, never schooled at the same places. But commonly, the common ground is that we're humans have a similar principles and values that we can align with. And I think that's why we can work well together, like with everybody in this panel. They're, we all come from diverse backgrounds, but there's a commonality. And I think when companies can find that in who they think we are, then they can be a lot more successful. Um, and I've, I've, seen a lot more now there's a lot more recruitment happening on diversity there's a lot more diversity inclusion jobs in the last 12 months i could not believe the number of jobs on linkedin for diversity and recruitment diversity inclusion officers managers suddenly companies were realizing and i, I had this conversation with a, a C, a, an executive level from the curing from one of the curing brands on the follow-up of black lives matter realized they did not have this in place in in italy and they suddenly had to set up a, an executive team to suddenly take this on board and realize and look around the table and see out of the 12, 15 of us, what do what and who do we represent? And they suddenly formulated a whole new executive team of diverse background. And then now these are the key leaders who are channeling through from top to bottom, 
how the company hires from shop floor level to, to let senior level. Uh, because they'd never really looked in at themselves. They were always just looking at the world out and they had never really paid attention. And it took a, a few hard conversations, a few hard truths. I think people may have fallen out, suddenly realized, ah, you don't think the way I do, but we sit next to you and have coffee every day, but we actually don't share the same values. And I think it's getting underneath the skin. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to have those conversations, but they have to be had to ch for positive change. So um, just to finish up, I'm seeing positive change from the recruitment perspective of being able to offer people jobs of all backgrounds. And I think companies now are embracing that hopefully, but I think it's going to take time because there has been a, well, they've always been washed in a certain way. And we see TV adverts, we see campaigns, but again, as we all know, as you go up the chain, the, the command of to the chairman and CEO level, it doesn't always filter through. And I think that's where the big changes have to happen still. Thank you. And um, Deanna, um, I'm taking back to a comment you made in the past where, you know, at the FT conference where there's such a big focus, for example, by some companies just on reducing the carbon footprint as their m most important sustainable goal, obviously, you know, t to reduce the uh, impact of climate change. But you, you said it was much wider than that. And you did earlier. And I I'm assuming that this wider perspective includes social responsibility and also, you know, uh, makeup of the workforce, well-being of the workforce, the, the complete package. Absolutely. I mean, I totally agree with uh, Yunus. And I think, you know, um, I think the key word is diversity and diversity is not just black, brown, it's also white because we actually will be in danger of the white. I mean, of course, the, this, the white supremacy has been there for a long time, but if we go totally in the other direction, we kind of actually, this equality could, you know, be um, uh, perhaps jeopardized. And I see this as a, from a women's perspective. I mean, when the whole women movement started, I was young in my career and um, I've been asked to be on boards just because it's a really nice token to have. So now if you're a woman that is a black woman, uh, that's great because that's also you will be asked to be in a board. So I think it's more than just ticking a box exercise at a board level or a CEO level. Um, I think that, of course, recruitment is massively important uh, and giving opportunities and also investing into these young people that might not have all the opportunities to come through the school, to come through the ladders. You know, if you want to do, uh, you know, social res responsibility, find those communities in which, you know, like footballers, you know, the best footballers come from, okay, I have to say Argentina because I'm from there. So I probably <laughs> will be unbelievably unpopular. But, you know, I mean, footballers, you have scouts out there that it doesn't really matter which color, which religion, which ethnicity, or which sex they are in terms of which chosen sex they have. You just pick them because they're brilliant and because you want a team, you want to ensemble a winning team to do just that. Um, I think that's what we need to do in corporations. And that also, there's a massive part of this, which is about appraisal. So, you know, when you have the people in the organization, how do you make sure that you don't have biases when you appraise, when you promote, when you take that the ladder and you ask? So it's not about what you think, but what they think, you know, and uh, it's about having that, uh, you know, um, understanding that, you know, if you promote somebody that is just a mother just now, I had a small child, just go back to work, does she want more responsibility? Maybe not. I mean, I think you we talked about this. Maybe not. So, you know, let her have this great role as mom. Let's have the job and then revisit that. But do it at, in a kind of, um, I guess, in a, in a, as a team, as a team with your team. Um, so it's massively important to look at it all the way throughout. And biases, everyone needs to be uh, trained. And you just make a fantastic point about the job floor. And this is like not just about the people that work in the in the in the shop floor, but how are people that come through the door perceived? And what are the biases that they can have of the people coming through the door that they, they, when they come in? So I can give you my clear example. Clearly, you have noticed I have an accent, right? <laughs> and sometimes you also notice that I don't get the words in the right order, right? Um, but I actually, you know, I learned English very late in life and I'm clearly not from here. 
but yet I can be a great contributor to, to the economy and to, and to the intellectual capital of the country, which my adopted country, which I'm very proud to be. But when people talk to, to me the first time they meet me, they shout at me. It's like, I'm not deaf, I'm just foreign. So it's, it's, uh, everybody has their biases. And sometimes the ones that are slightly more onto that receiving end. It's Diana, easy to Diana I will see you as a, as a star and you're exceedingly <laughs> eloquent. Um, we're we're, we're, we're really running a bit short of time. Um, I'm going to pass over to Natasha and then um, to Sophie. So Natasha, do you want to add some perspectives on, on this? I think it just really, the points that everyone have made shows how interconnected and complex these sort of issue, issues are. And I think that's one thing that can be quite overwhelming as you sort of dip your toe in this area. So you might have got into the conversation you know, as Sophie said, because you've seen, um, you know, an influencer or you're really excited about Depop. And then that's sort of, you know, even like myself, I just I used to like second hand clothes because it was the style that I wanted to wear. I, and I didn't see that particularly as being a sustainable practice, but we now kind of see it framed in that way. You know, then to the complexities about materials we're using, where they're sourced from, who's doing the labor. Um, and, and how we're represented. I mean, fashion and luxury are, are big global industries and they themselves have a lot of different facets. So I think it's um, all of this conversation shows the complexities. It also shows how important it is. I'm really happy we're having this conversation because quite often fashion and luxury are seen as sort of trivial matters that somehow things aren't designed, that decisions aren't made. And I think, you know, just pulling it slightly back towards the sort of circular economy model, which is all about capturing value and preventing waste we can even see that has a social perspective just in you know the contributions that other panel may members have made so i think again it's a little bit of a mindset shift um, to start thinking about to stop thinking about how we extract value from materials and from people you know people shouldn't be thought of as a you know that human resource but as their sort of whole selves and then how we actually um open up potential and I think that's one of the places you know that I know you Tim and I really agree on in terms of how education supports having those really difficult conversations there's not one answer to any of these sort of issues but the connectiveness is a really important sort of thread um, that goes through them. Brilliant thank you and that's a perfect segue into my question to Sophie it's almost as though it was scripted um, Sophie I mean first of all are you optimistic as both um, you know, a graduate and soon to be postgraduate and someone working in early stages of your career about the future. Um, and secondly, um, from what Natasha said, those conversations, do you feel that in the British School of Fashion you've had exposure to those sorts of conversations and varying points of view throughout your studies? I'm super optimistic um, because it's just getting better and better. There's more, there's more conflict um, in the sense that there's more confrontation, I guess is the word. Um, but that's a positive thing because the positive outcomes of that confrontation is only going to be long lasting, good, positive results all around. Um, and I actually thought of the, um, even though it's not fashion, um, of the Goldman uh, Sachs, all the junior bankers who came together and created that massive survey on uh, their, um, they called it inhuman working conditions completely unheard of that a you know a, a young banking team would go against you know the big scary board and they did and it and it really has helped the conditions there um and so and so also a kind of not a trend i don't want to say but um a movement going on right now is um kind of exposing companies who are very uh very integrated into pride in june but then the rest of the and pride month yeah. but in the rest of the year um they're not really present and they're not doing the actual work that needs to be done to be uh, supportive of that so all of these things even though they're confrontational and even though um it might be a, a spouse of negativity or uncomfortableness um essentially the the positive impact from that later on is just going to be long lasting and hopefully um shaping the industry um all industries in a better way um, and also I think for companies if they want to find future talent talent that is going to stay with them and last for a long time and actually really help them improve then there are just certain aspects that you need to have that you need to focus on ESG you need to be inclusive you need to have a really um, 
clear expression um, and ex transparency. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm super positive. I'm super um, optimistic about what's to come. And of course, I have um, learned so much through British School of Fashion and I'm super thankful because um, I didn't even realize how much I could do just by being knowledgeable about uh, not having the knowledge and going in and being like, actually, look at all of these trends, which we learned through theory and contemporary issues and have the backing, have the information and have the knowledge to be able to actually put my foot down, even though I'm in a super entry level role and be like, no, we should do this. This is what is the future. This is what is good. This is what's going to give us a positive impact and then also a positive long term, hopefully, you know. Thank Success. you. Thank you. I mean, uh, you know, that 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 really is it, isn't it, Eunice, uh, that brands really need to to have that almost millennial panel um, in the organization. And it goes back to what Deanna says about sort of a more diverse workforce. So you've, you've got that kind of insights um, that are not that are actually reflective of your consu wider consumer base and not of a particular point of view. Um, and I think the point that you also made, Sophie, was that ha there has to be authentic. It, it, it has to be genuine and people will bypass or sniff out fakery, if you like, um, fake news, as Mr. Trump used to refer to. So, um, you know, we've got five minutes left. I haven't seen any questions as yet. Um, I don't know if oh, any we do have, have some questions. Sorry. OK, so please um, let would you be kind enough to articulate those questions? Yeah, before? sure. There's a question here that's from Andy. And Andy says, fashion seems to have very much made the move to online. The mix of nice looking gear, images and influencers and low prices seem very hard um, to see an end to. And he says, I've heard the net being described as steroidal to linear growth with all its complex issues. What does the panel think is the way to get off this track in the global north? Um, I have a few on that, but I'll just hand over to either Eunice or uh, Deanna um, first. Um, I'm happy to, to give it a go to this. Um, I think it's going to take time. Um, I think more influences that, like Sophie just said, are also having the contra the contra trend. Like, you know, there's a lot of that, you know, travel, etc. There's a lot of ones that are actually coming from a different direction. So I think it's going to be loud voices and the one that shouts harder and louder will win the race. But I think that it's not just about the global north. I think this is happening everywhere. And uh, and it's going to, it's going to caught up sometime in, in, in not, not in the very distant future. And it's not going to happen tomorrow, next year, or probably in the next three years. But it's something that is going to actually flip. And Sophie said something really profound. And, you know, she's a very inspiring lady. And, uh, yeah, you really inspire me because, you know, what you described earlier is the movement and the courage uh, that people like Greta at that things very early age and people like you, actually, Sophie, to actually you know, speak up and say your truth and your voice. And uh, and this is what we need. We need less of, you know, beating around the bush and more confrontation was the word you use, but, you know, in terms of challenge, uh, challenging companies. So I think all in all, it's going to take a little bit of time, but I have, if I have to put the money somewhere, I'll put them in the alphas and the Gen Zs. Thank you. Um were there any other questions there, Natasha? Yeah, there's a question from Ashima, which I think is, is perfect for Eunice because it's about employ employability. So um, talking about in, the, in London, the employability status, will the pandemic hamper our job prospects? And how do companies balance sort of experience versus skills? And also a little bit about the sort of technical courses, the types of things that you were mentioning, even if we're studying sort of management, you know, do, what sort of tech, I suppose, experience do you advise? Um, okay, it's a good question. So I think at the moment, um, the, the the biggest contender for people looking for jobs, as I'm sure we all have known people around us, is the volume of traffic there is. I spoke to a client the other day and they said, um, you know, for every CV we're getting, we're getting 10 to 15 times as many volume of applicants. So there is a way, obviously, to have to stand out from the crowd. You're against heavy competition. So there is a level of patience that's required and resilience. Um, a lot of people have got so depressed and down about their job applications and going through this, it's a job looking for a job. Um, if you have the, have the support of mentors through education, through recruiters, through careers people, do lean on them. 
I found myself in the pandemic, the first part, and I did some work with Tim and other universities, just being a shoulder to lean on. And I, one great opportunity I had was from Burberry, from a friend of mine who works at the Regent Street store, who's the part of their support team. And they have a health and wellness calendar. And for the month of, a couple of months, they were doing, calling talk speakers in to support the retail team with their careers, just what should we do? How can we support ourselves? How can we upgrade our CVs, LinkedIn? So even people in employment are still considering their sales on the market, how they perceived and a lot of time um, they just didn't know how to go about it and they felt a little bit overwhelmed. So there are certain things you need to do, like have your CV updated, have your LinkedIn profile, make yourself visible on the market if you're looking for work because otherwise the jobs are not gonna come to you. You will have to put some work in to, to get through to those jobs and applications that you want, do follow them up. But do seek help from professionals that can possibly guide you. And I'm happy to do that as well, as Tim always knows, to lend a hand. It is a challenging market out there. You will have to try to find ways to stand out from the crowd because employers have now the, the pick of the bunch and they are doing so to invest in the right people, not to make short term decisions of taking staff on that they later realize after three month probation haven't worked out. So take onus upon yourself to learn some new skills. Um, there are Google courses. There are lots of, if you search, a lot of free online courses. And a lot of courses now are reducing um, cost levels because they know there is a, lot, a number of people that need to take these courses up who don't have a lot of money to spend. So companies also are investing in allowing to do programs for new starters to come on board and be trained into certain skill sets. But if it means thinking out of your normal parameter and thinking, well, where, what, I would say do a SWOT, it's the usual thing, do a SWOT analysis of your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, um, obstacles, and look at also what it is that you're really passionate about. Do you want to be doing the same job that you did for the last 20 years, but just because you got made redundant, does that mean that's always what you wanted to do, or you just, it was paycheck? And now it could be a good time to, as we say, the, the caption of the last year has been reinventing yourself or transformation, everybody's going through transformation, but it's not a bad time to look, and there are a lot more opportunities in areas that you possibly had not thought about, or always passionate about i've seen people go from corporate jobs to creative jobs from bricks and mortar to suddenly to digital from office jobs to suddenly i don't want to be sat at a desk all day i've got a back problem i want to be doing something outdoors i've suddenly gone into retraining into something they could do into yoga teaching because that gives them a lot more joy and happiness so i think fulfilling yourself and i think everybody who's sat here today is passionate about what they do and that's part of enjoying your career your job number one so if, if you can find what you're passionate about and find if there's a market for it, um, it sounds really obvious, but if you look at where the economy is going and where things are pivoting to, and if you want to have a career for the next 10, 15 years, think, is what I enjoy going to fit into that marketplace and how will I fit into it? Will it be on a tech level? Will it be on a human level? Another point, I had so many people, candidates and clients, retraining HR. CIPD courses were going through the roof. People... Um, companies are now hiring head of people. I mean, if you look at the title, what is head of people? Why do we need a, a head of people? We're A company should be looking after us anyway through our HR and through our management. But now you have a division which says, are you okay? Are you well? I mean, it's kind of crazy in a way that we even need that. But it's been created. So what I'm trying to get at is there are many divisions in, in roles in companies that we traditionally would not have known existed. And there are ways of if you look at yourself thinking, do I fit that skill set? Is it something I'm passionate about? So um, I would say speak to a recruiter. If, you, if you're a little bit lost and you feel like you're going around in the dark, speak to people that can help you. Maybe declutter some of these questions that you have um, and try to get a bit more clarity. But it is, it is a challenging market. I'm not going to lie. It is very challenging out there. But there is opportunity. There are lots of opportunities out there. You just have to be a little bit more creative and resilient and a little bit thick skin. If you get rejections, you move on to the next one. And if you don't hear back from employers, it's not because they're being slack. They have purposely taken the, the opinion of we're only gonna reply back to people who've been successful because the volumes are so high. Even though I do think everybody should get at least a polite note to say thank you, but no thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. that's that's <laughs> fantastic insights into that we, we are out of time but i just want to to offer diana um sophie and natasha a last word literally um you know any any last thought advice it's up to you just um in 30 seconds if you could diana 
Um, for me, it's just thank you. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity and to be here with you and Professor Natasha and Jonas and Sophie and to learn and be inspired. So that's it for me, really. Thank you. Thank you. And Natasha? Yes, thank you. It's been a, a fabulous panel. We've covered a lot of different areas and we've also had some really nice comments from Jordan in the chat um, directing people to online resources. So thanks for that, for joining in from home. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> um, last word to Sophie. I mean, you know, we are a school. We, we, we live and die by people like you. Um, any last thoughts? And, and thank you very much for, for coming on and contributing. Thank you so much. I'm super flattered and honoured to be even to be asked uh, to join here. So especially amongst all of you um, great and also inspiring people and in, in your jobs and super happy. And um, also thank you obviously so much for letting me speak about the school and about my great experience. And um, yeah, thank you from all the students behalf, I should say as well, probably it's been really great and yeah. the way you've managed to like manoeuvre throughout this whole digital era has been really impressive. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I just want to thank you all once again for, for giving up your time and your expertise. And um, to the audience out there, this is what we are, British School of Fashion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>